Welcome to today's webinar and thanks so much for joining us today as I know a lot of you are on vacation. Uh, today's webinar includes two separate projects, the Innovation for Toilet Relocation to Ease Access for Frail Elderly at Home and the Wearable Caregiver Posture Coaching System or Coaching Feedback System. So at the end of this uh, webinar, we will have our normal Q&A session. So please submit your questions during the presentation and we will try to get to as many as possible. And if there's some remaining at the end, we'll forward them on to our presenter today and hopefully we'll be able to get an answer. Um, the survey, uh, there is a survey at the end of the webinar, which we're trying to get feedback on to improve the webinar series. And the webinar slides and the video will be available within the next 24 to 48 hours. And you'll see the, the uh, link there on the screen. Just uh, so that you can register for the upcoming web webinars, which aren't going to be done until September. So September 13th, we have the Locust for Seniors and a Medical Psychiatry Population with Rose Geist and Richard Chulman. And on Wednesday, September the 27th, we have Improving Palliative Care in Long-Term Care Homes Using Participatory Action Research. And that is with, uh, from both from McMaster, oh, McMaster and McGill. And on November 22nd, uh, we have Rick Sawatsky uh, doing his Integrating a Quality of Life Assessment and Practice Support System in Palliative Home Care. We probably will be listing more webinars as we um, finalize the details. So please look at our website and you will see the listing of the webinars to, to come in the next few months. So right now, and we have a knowledge translation competition in process and the full applications are due on September 15th or September 5th. And please visit our website if you're filling in the final application and you can see that on the screen as well. And we are working on a new competition and looking for partners at the moment and it is expected to be launched early fall late summer. So today I would like to introduce the presenter Talak Duda. He is a scientist at Toronto Rehab Institute and currently leads the home and community team. He holds an assistant professor appointment with the Institute for Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Toronto. His ultimate goal of all his work is giving older adults and their caregivers the tools and knowledge they need to age successfully in their own homes. So go ahead, Talak, look forward to your presentation. Sure, thanks. Thanks for that introduction um, and thanks to everyone joining us today. I'm going to just go full screen on this. Okay. Um, yes, thanks so much. It's uh, it's a great group here. Uh, Matt LeBranch sent me the list of people who had registered for this and was really interested to see the uh, breadth of interests and organizations that were represented there. So thanks so much for tuning in and I will definitely try to make it worth your while today. So um, I want to start off with uh, by considering a scenario. So imagine we have two frail older adults living at home and imagine one of them has just had a stroke. So in this case, let's say the husband in this picture uh, has just had a stroke um, and he's been treated in the hospital and he's about to be, um, he's, he's about to return home. And I want you to think about the situation and and you know kind of putting ourselves in their shoes for a moment what are the challenges that they're about to face and what life is about to look like for them so uh he if if he's had a stroke there's a there's a good chance he's on all sorts of new medications um it's it's probably a frightening time for him these medications you know a lot of them have funny side effects um, he likely has a a, a you know, he's he's very likely to have a balance deficit as a result of his stroke. So he may be using a walker or a cane or a wheelchair. Um, 
the medications he's on may be exacerbating those balance problems. Uh, his wife is has been thrown into this new role as a caregiver uh, for her husband. Maybe she has little training in in this sort of work has never really uh, provided medical care to someone. She now has to get him up out of bed into his wheelchair if he needs one, into the bathroom. Uh, she has to get him onto the toilet, into the bathtub. Um, she has to make sure he gets dressed and he gets enough to eat and he gets his medications on time. She's also trying to coordinate um, all, all sorts of appointments, medical appointments, so that he can have follow-ups. Has, she has to figure out how to get him out of the house, into the car. Um, that probably is not a trivial challenge even in uh, you know the first week of August, but I want you to think about what that challenge might look like the first week of February. Trying to get out of the house after we've had a snowfall where there's some ice and snow around the home. Um, there, it's easy to see, I think, that it's a really, there are a lot of risks and challenges that, that this couple is going to have to deal with. And, and, if, and really, what tools and knowledge do they have that allow them to solve those problems? That's, that's really the question that our team at Toronto Rehab Institute, the home and community team, what we try to, um, we, we try to work on. We try to help people successfully age in their own homes as long as possible, and we try to figure out what tools and training we can give them to fill in some of these gaps to try to reduce the risks that uh, that they may be facing. Uh, specifically, today we're going to talk about um, risks around falling. Uh, we're going to talk about risks around um, getting hurt. So, so there's the risk that uh, the husband will fall trying to get in and out of the tub or, or trying to get on and off the toilet. Um, there's the risk that his wife will hurt herself trying while she's trying to support all these, these activities with a lot of, there's going to be a lot of lifting and moving. Um, and, and of course, because he's at risk of falling, there's the chance that he's going to start falling and she's going to try to intervene and prevent him from falling. And, and a classic scenario where you could get a really bad back injury as a result. So um, so those are some of the things that that our team works on and and uh, and the Canadian Frailty Network has funded three projects that I want to talk about today. I know the the title in the abstract for this presentation talks about the first two, but I actually think it's really important that we, I touch on a third one, which is uh, that that scenario of having to go outside in the winter, uh, making sure that people are safe when they leave their homes and and go into the community as well. So I'm going to touch on that because it was work that that uh, the Canadian Frailty Network did fund through a couple of postdoctoral fellowships, and I'll talk more about that uh, a little later. But let's start with toileting. So bathrooms, we know, are, are one of the areas of, of kind of highest risk and highest challenge for frail older adults, uh, especially if you have a balance problem. A product that we've been working on to try to to try to make some of these challenges easier around toileting is called Toy Locator or Toilet Relocator. And um, we came upon this idea after doing a home visit with uh, a client um, who had this bathroom. This is the actual kind of recreation of, of a gentleman's bathroom. This gentleman had very um, really bad arthritis in his knees and his hips. He had a lot of trouble moving around, but he was able to move around. He was able to get himself um, from his bedroom and move around the house using his walker, um, but he wasn't able to independently toilet. And the reason, the main reason, was because there wasn't enough space for him to bring the walker with him when he came into the bathroom. So he he had no way of maintaining that extra stability with the with the walker as he tried to get himself onto the toilet because of that space between the front edge of the toilet and the edge of the bathtub was so narrow. Um, and so that prompted us to think about a couple of things. Um, and, and we came up with this idea and it was working with a team including Pam Holiday, Steve Pong um, and others. Jeff Fernie is the Institute Director at Toronto Rehab and he, um, 
he is he was also very much involved in the design of this idea um, and the concept is basically to come up with an adapter that you could mount the toilet onto so that the soil pipe could stick off to one side and you could actually shift the position of the toilet from in that corner where it was stuck out a little bit just to give a little bit more space and make it a little bit more accessible um, we also have the added benefit in this case that uh, that it having this adapter put under the toilet raises the toilet up um, which is a benefit for people who have issues with their knees. If you have arthritis in your knees, you will find getting on and off a low uh, seat or a low toilet very difficult. And so the way people, uh, the, the other way you can deal with that problem is by putting a, a toilet riser on top of the toilet seat, um, you know, three or four inches up that makes it easier to get on and off the toilet. Um, this, our concept was actually building on a, uh, another product that's uh, already on the market and has been for a couple of decades now called Toilevator, Toilet Elevator, which raises the toilet by putting this four inch adapter, uh, uh, just a simple four inch adapter that wouldn't change the position of the toilet, but would lift it up four inches. It has the benefit over the other product that goes on top of the toilet in that it stays clean and it looks a little bit more natural. Um, and people that use this one, it is, it is obviously a little bit more work to install this one, but once you have it in place, if you go and look on Amazon for this product, you'll see that people love it. People love it way more than those other cheaper um, on the, the ones that you put on top of the toilet. So our idea was, could we take the same idea, the same product idea, and can we adapt it to allow us to actually shift the toilet um, to one side? And so the project that was funded through the Canadian Frailty Network um, was to kind of explore this design idea to build kind of a concept prototype and to survey a number of people, uh, you know, clinicians as well as older adults and, and people that have knowledge of the challenges uh, around toileting and to see what they thought the benefits and the limitations of, of this idea might be. So, um, Oh, the other, the other benefit, by the way, it, aside from making the toilet more accessible for the person who's using it, um, we also have the benefit of creating a bit more space for a caregiver. So in the scenario we talked about earlier, you know, one of the biggest challenges that the husband and wife will have is that, that the, the bathroom that they're likely to be working in was really designed for one person to use and not for a pair of people and and so as soon as you introduce a caregiver whether it's a PSW as you see in the picture on the right or if it's someone if it's the family member they really don't they really can't position themselves appropriately to support any of these activities the the toileting activities you're always you find these people are bent and twisted in funny angles trying to support these activities this picture by the way is from uh, from a study uh, the PhD project of uh, Emily King who recently got her PhD um, and uh, I'll be showing you a few more pictures that that are the result of her work that really uh, exemplify some of the challenges we see in the bathroom um, these for her study she did a, a really extensive analysis of bathing and toileting activities by bringing in patient actors so these were older adults that kind of played the part of being someone who is unstable um, or or had different physical limitations and and had real psws interact with them kind of go through all the motions that you would go through if you were bathing or toileting someone uh, to see what the extent of these kind of awkward postures and risky positions that people get themselves into, what, what those were. So, um, so this was the model that, that we built. Adam Bedzinski was the, was a um, uh, OCAD student that, that worked with us, the research assistant that worked with us to build this. He, he it was a mock-up uh, that he created in a space where we could invite people around to look at it and kind of stand in it and see what it what it felt like to use a walker or a cane to move in and out of that space. Um, 
and and overall i think we had somewhere around 30 or 40 people kind of give their feedback on this including clinicians and some older adults and some assistive device users um, the one thing that might look funny here in this model is the soil pipe as it extends out from the uh, from the left side of the toilet here you can see that that it actually is angled up a little bit that's just a, a kind of a artifact of the way we built the model. In in reality, this would be sloping downwards. There's a, the building code defines the angle that that would need to slope down at so that it would clear uh, stuff coming out of the toilet, obviously. Um, but that does bring up the kind of the main constraint that we have with this design is the further you want to move it away from where the, the, the drain is in, in the bathroom, the higher this riser needs to be. And so uh, there, you know, it's, it's sort of a trade-off between how high you want to go and how far out you want to move it. Um, most of the comments that we got on this really were around it being too high for some people who need to use it. Uh, so the, even the four-inch Toilevator product, it, we know that's been on the the market for a couple of decades we know that that's too high for some shorter people they they couldn't it doesn't really benefit them so in the same way adding um, a little bit more somewhere between four and five inches to get this thing to move uh, some distance away from the soil pipe it introduces a little bit more height and so one of the bits of feedback we got is that you know for someone to void effectively we need their knees to come up and their feet to come off the floor and so introducing some sort of a step that they can pull their feet up onto um, to support toileting um, it will be an important part of this design so having whether it's a fixed step that you slide in into place after the person is seated on the toilet or whether it's a flip down uh, something that flips down from the front of the toilet or the adapter uh, remains to be discussed, but that's that's one of the ideas that we're thinking about. Um, so among the, the different people that sort of reviewed this, um, we had uh, one person who really drew uh, attention to the problem in condos. So it's a, this was a real estate agent um, who deals specifically with accessible um, real estate, finding accessible uh, accommodations for people with disabilities and people who use wheelchairs or walkers and things. And one of the challenges he runs into all the time is with condos, you have this fixed soil pipe. At least in a typical home, you have the option, uh, it's an expensive option of doing a, uh, a renovation, um, but, um, but in a condo, you don't have the ability to move that soil pipe in out from away from that corner at all and so in his view this was the only solution that would that can sometimes be available to make those bathrooms accessible and so he was a big proponent of that um, we had a and based on kind of most of that positive feedback that we got um, we spoke with American Standard to see if they'd be interested in commercializing this. And, and unfortunately, the punchline right now, unfortunately, is that they are not interested in taking on this product, um, which is a pretty, um, you know, classic challenge with commercializing ideas. Um, just because you have a good idea doesn't mean that there's someone who's willing to take a risk to produce the product and get it out on the market for you. So we're, uh, so that's one we're still looking at um, other alternatives. Um, and if anyone on the call today happens to know of someone who, who, a company that we should be getting in touch with, please do let me know. So I talked a little bit about, um, I'll move on to the, the second, um, product uh, project now which is which is uh, the one that looks at preventing back injuries and we talked a little bit about the risk of injury to personal support workers already um, we have a related study that's a kind of a survey of personal support workers where we've asked them a bunch of questions one of them was um, ha have you experienced a work-related injury in the past year about a quarter of, of our respondents said yes uh, about a third of them said that they still feel pain or, or are affected in some way from in, uh, past injury and it still affects them on their job now. And if you ask them which body part that most commonly happens in, it's uh, the, the biggest chunk in that pie, I apologize if that's too small, but the biggest chunk in that pie is, is the low back. 
So back injuries, low back injuries are a really big problem for personal support workers. That's a picture of Emily on the bottom right there and some more pictures of her of her study with personal support workers and patient actors. Um, and you can get a sense of some of the uh, extreme postures that you know people have to get into that these personal support workers have to uh, have to adopt to be able to do many of these toileting and bathing tasks. We don't have any numbers on what that means for the informal family caregiver, of course, but uh, but we expect the challenges are the same. And so, what what we think as a build on to what Emily's great work uh, has shown is is that there is a need to try to train people to perform these activities safer and that's that would be a benefit to both personal support workers or the informal caregiver um, to just zoom in on on you know back injuries and what kind of the goal is and how we prevent them briefly um, if we zoom in on the spine you know I mentioned the most of the injuries we see are into the low back region. Um, if you zoom in on that part of the body, you see that the spine is, is built up of bones and a series of vertebrae, and in between them, we have intervertebral discs. That's, that's sort of like the fragile part of the spine that, that allows some flexibility, but it's also the part that we want to maintain um, we we want to protect it as much as we can. Um, along the back, we have these bony extensions that connect together when you're standing upright, but separate apart when you bend. Um, and running through the middle is your spinal cord and the nerves that branch off of it. You know, often what when we talk about people getting back pain or a back injury, what's happened is there's something about there's something unhealthy about the intervertebral disc that prevents it from being able to support the loads it needs to. And so you get some of these nerves that branch out from the spinal cord, some of them getting pinched um, and, and that leading to pain. And the easiest ways, you know, two ways you can think of that we could reduce the risk of injury or back pain um, for, for these workers or for family caregivers is, is to try to avoid uh, lifting too much, so trying to avoid lifting any more than 35 pounds. Um, and then the other one is to try to avoid flexing the spine. You know, there's, you've probably heard the idea that you should be keeping your back straight when you lift. Um, the, you know, the reality is that, that it would be nice if we could tell people don't bend, you know, you, try to bend from the knees and the hips rather than uh, bending your upper body, your torso, when you have to provide care. But the reality is that many of the tasks that these personal support workers or family caregivers have to do, it, it, bending is unavoidable. You have to bend to do these tasks. Um, but there is a safer way to bend. Um, there is a good way and a bad way to bend, if you want to put it that way. Um, the good way to bend, what you want to do is keep those facet joints, we want to maintain this curve, this natural curve that we all have in our low back. We want to maintain that curve as we bend. So we're actually flexing from the hips rather than flexing the spine. What happens when we flex the spine and we separate is we separate those facet joints at the back of the spine and we concentrate our loads on the intervertebral discs and so the load that they experience is higher and the risk of an injury or, or some sort of harm to that tissue is higher. In contrast, if we keep the curve in our low back and bend from the hips instead, if we keep this part of our back locked together, we share the load across not only the disc but also the bony parts of the spine and you can support a lot more weight safely. So it's one thing to tell people that, maybe in a training session, you can explain that that's what you should be trying to do. Um, but when it comes to going out in the field, operationalizing that lesson and making sure people can actually follow, you know, remember that and keep it top of mind is, you know, how do you, how you do that and how you actually translate that lesson into a change in behavior is not easy. It's not trivial. Um, and so our team... We, we've been thinking for a while that there needs to be some sort of a prompt that, that it would be beneficial for a healthcare, someone delivering care, to have a prompt that would let them, that would tell them that they might be bending 
or they might be flexing their spine or, or bending in an unsafe way so that they could readjust their posture when uh, when they get that prompt. So the, the project uh, was originally called Lift Coach. We changed the name to Posture Coach, but it's based on these two, uh, two of these sensors. These are called shimmer uh, inertial measure, uh, inertial measurement units. They have accelerometers, magnetometers, and gyros in them. Um, basically, they allow you to track the orientation, so the angles that this thing moves in in all three dimensions. So you can tell how far forward you're bending, you can tell how much you're twisting and how much you're bending to the side from the a pair of these sensors, one mounted on a belt around, uh, around your kind of your waist and one around um, kind of on the upper torso. And what we can do is we can prompt someone if they end up being in a posture where they're flexing their spine like this, we can give them a little prompt. It, the, these little sensors talk to a, an Android phone, um, and the phone has an app built on it that, that will vi cause the phone to beep or vibrate if someone uh, is bending the wrong way rather than the right way. So given a little beep or a vibration, they can hopefully adjust their posture. That was the basic concept. Here is a, an example of what the system looks like in action. Um, the computer screen on the left is just, you know, normally the system would be running off a phone, but just to give you an idea of what, how the system is measuring these angles, you can see a little stick person on the left moving along with our, our caregiver actor here as she performs some, some different care activities. And you can see there's an exclamation mark that pops up when the angle between those two sensors uh, exceeds a, a threshold that we preset there. So the idea is we wanted to evaluate that system to get a number of clinicians and users to, uh, you know, potential users of such a system to try it out and see how the, the feedback worked to give us their comments on it um, and to see whether we could reduce the amount that people, the, the amount of time people spent in bent postures. So a couple of occupational therapy students worked, joined our team um, and they, uh, they had 18 different people use the system and go through the series of activities that you just saw in that video. So helping someone out of bed, putting a sling under someone, getting them onto a toilet, uh, just some typical care, uh, sort of this series of care tasks. Um, we had six, the, so Daniel and Theo, Dan and Theo were the two that did the most work on this. Um, six people were kind of complete novices, no experience with any kind of client handling or patient handling. Six were occupational, um, sorry, I've got something coming up on my screen here. There we go, I'll move that away. Um, so six people who were occupational therapy or physiotherapy students, and six were people who are occupational therapists, physiotherapists, or nurses that have been doing this sort of thing for a long time and had a lot of experience. And what we saw right away was that um, people with no experience had a big benefit from the system. So what you're seeing here is the percent of time on the on the vertical axis that someone is spending um, that someone is spending in a different uh, at the, these various uh, flexion angles. So bigger numbers of flexion are bad. So what you see is before they had the feedback turned on from the system, they were wearing this posture coach system, performing that activity, that series of activities that I showed you in the video. And these blue bars show you the angles that they, the histogram of the angles that they spent time in. So you can see they spent the most time at a 35 degree um, flexion angle. What you see then when we turn the feedback from Posture Coach on, you see instead of that blue curve, we see the red bars has shifted back. You can see now there's less time spent at 35. There's, there's more time spent now in the kind of 15 or 20 degree bending flexion angles. What's really interesting for us was that when we turn the feedback off during a third trial, people um, these novices, the six novices we had, actually um, did even better on the third time through. So they sort of learned and remembered the, what they did and they kind of did even better. Um, 
these are these are obviously this is a pilot study with small sample numbers, so we'll take that all with a grain of salt. But you can definitely see that there's there's some effect happening here as a result of that feedback being turned on and off. Um, when we go to, in contrast, when we look at someone with more experience, so here you have uh, people who've been doing this a lot, what you see is their uh, kind of before or their baseline is not that different from their after, their, you know, when you turn the feedback on. These, they started off working at relatively low uh, flexion angles and they continue to do so even when we had feedback. So uh, a pretty neat finding for people that have that background. Um, they seem to um, they seem to know uh, yeah they, they seem to maybe not benefit from the system as much. Here's the uh, the three groups shown here uh, and you see that we did see differences statistically significant differences for the novice people between that baseline the first and second trials really here's what we're comparing um, the uh, for the novices who have no experience as well as for the OT and PT students who have some kind of you know some experience but not a lot you know we see a, a difference there as well they're spending less time in bent postures when posture coach is turned on uh, the clinicians no significant difference um, what we learned maybe from the first version of that, from that study, was that there were a lot of limitations to that system. The first was that the system, keeping those sensors attached to the person wearing them is one of the biggest challenges. They kept slipping up and down. Um, so we, we set off to try to design version two posture coach that would try to address some of those challenges. So one was to make it harnessed more tightly and, and more cleverly at the bot around the body so that it didn't move um, and to make it easier to interact with so the app at first sounded like a good idea but as soon as we started kind of playing with it more we realized that the system it took too many clicks to you know too many button presses to get those Bluetooth sensors paired the the two sensors turned on and paired and get the system up and running and to, to where you're actually getting feedback from the system. So we realized for the system to work for real people in the field, it needed to be a single switch that turned it on and got it going, a standalone system. So we've uh, we got some fun funding from AgeWell um, that we've just come to an end on that grant, but we have a system now designed that Mohamed Olia on the right there, he's a master student who's now going to uh, evaluate version two to see how well it works a much hope we're hoping for a much simpler easier uh, more robust system uh, in the second version um, and then the big question you know that we have to answer yet is how often should this system be used if you're a family caregiver is it something you wear whenever you're doing any bathing and toileting activities is it something that a personal support worker would wear for like a week at a time and then they would kind of learn safer patterns of behavior and they would become uh, used to doing it that way and then you, you could take posture coach away and they would still use these safer patterns of movement. Um, St. Elizabeth has been working closely with us on this project um, and there's a, we're in discussions to think about doing a startup company once we once we answer a few more of these questions uh, thinking about a startup company to get this product out. And now I want to move to the third part of um, this touch on the, the third uh, kind of challenge that people have that I alluded to, which is going outside in the winter and and the challenge that footwear can present. Um, so, you know, bringing someone outdoors in uh, in weather like this, this is a particularly bad, after a particularly bad ice, uh, you know, freezing rain fall, there's quite a bit of ice, but you can have less snow and ice and it still present a hazard. In fact, the smaller patches of ice can sometimes be some of the most hazardous because you don't see them. Um, and, you know, we, I talked about being able to take someone and take them to a doctor's appointment um, as one example, uh, but actually, you know, 
perhaps more important is simply not becoming inactive. You know, we know that the fall risk, I'm sure for those on on the call here today, you know, we're all familiar with the biggest, the, these downward spirals that we can get into in health if someone falls and, and potentially breaks a hip, right? There's this, this downward spiral in health that, that can be uh, sparked as a result of an incident like that of a fall um, that you can never recover from. Well, part of the reason that we have this downward spiral is because people, if they've had an injury as a result of the fall, they end up becoming uh, bed, you know, stuck in bed for a while and become inactive and sedentary. Well, we also know that people become sedentary in the winter when there's snow and ice on the ground. Frail older adults, we know that they, they need to stay active to stay healthy, and yet there's periods of the year when we know they are too afraid to go outside because they they are afraid of falling. And so, you know, one of the one of the, the real big goals we have is to help frail older adults um, understand better when they go and buy a pair of footwear, whether it's going to actually work for them when they go outdoors. And we've been studying, our team has been studying this for a long time. Uh, Jen Shu and Yue Li have been, have been studying footwear, winter footwear on ice and snow, and have come away with the conclusion that a lot of the boots and shoes that are marketed, uh, that you'll find uh, um, that look like they're made for, for winter wear, are terrible on ice and snow. Here's an example of a boot that if you saw it, you would you would say it looked well designed and, and someone had put a lot of thought into what it what the sole looked like and the tread pattern looked like. Um, but you would actually find that it doesn't that there's there's a one or two degree incline on that on that ramp that she just walked up that she's barely able to 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 walk on. So how do you know? How do you know if you were to go into a store and be faced with the challenge of buying footwear for someone, maybe someone in your family who's a frail person, you know, frail older adult that needs footwear, what would you select for them? You know, most of us flip the shoes or boots over and look at the tread patterns. Um, but what we know is that that's mostly superficial. But um, why don't we go ahead and try it anyways? Go ahead and pick which of these four you might select or recommend to someone who's looking for footwear. Um, and I'll show you how we test footwear. We do it in, in what we call Winter Lab here at Toronto Rehab Institute. This is a six meter by six meter lab that has an ice floor and can be tilted to different angles using this hydraulic uh, base that it's sitting on. And so here's what it looks like inside Winter Lab. Um, and we have uh, the, the gentleman who's walking across the ice surface there is our Institute Director, Jeff Fernie. Um, he's, you can see he's harnessed so that if he did ever fall, slip and fall, he would be at no risk of actually hurting himself. But you can see that we can quickly get a sense that the pair of footwear he's wearing there um, are barely able to walk up a one or two degree incline on a wet ice surface. So that pink area at the back is a wet ice surface. We can compare that to a different pair of footwear just to show you the dramatic differences that we've found in, in footwear materials that we've come across. You know, not all of these are available. Uh, this, this one specifically is not actually available on the market, but is a prototype material that, that we came across. And we found that instead of a two degree angle on the same wet ice surface, it's able to go up a 20 degree angle, which is actually difficult to climb up. So you, you can see the range of, um, of angles, we call it the achievable angle in Winter Lab that we're able to go up and you can see boot J, the one without any tread at all, is the one that, that actually performs outperforms all these other ones quite dramatically. Um, you might notice that, you know, the fact that boot N has some little yellow pieces of paint on there doesn't really improve its um, its performance over boot G. In fact, boot G is better than boot N, despite that kind of superficial um, detail that, that's been added there, right? And so I think that's the lesson that we've come out with here is that footwear manufacturers spend a lot of time making footwear look good, but it doesn't always perform well. Um, what makes Boot J work well? Well, we were we were blown away when we first came across this material. Um, it's a prototype material, as I said. It wouldn't be sold without any tread on it. It the point is that it's a material that we were testing for a company to see how well it performed, and they would include that in their in their soles. But we were so 
blown away by this material. Um, Dr. Uh, Rizvi, Reza joined our team, uh, thanks to a, a Canadian Frailty Network postdoctoral fellowship, to kind of look deeper into the material science of this, of this material. And so when he put this material under an electron microscope, he saw that there were these little glass uh, fibers that protruded out of the surface of the of the uh, of the sole, and that's what let it let it really grip that ice surface so well. Is was these little glass fibers that would dig into the ice surface. Um, but working with that material a little longer, we quickly found that that material lost its slip resistant property quite quickly. And so we, um, we set out really to develop our own version of this type of material that would have not only good slip resistance, but also good wear resistance. So this is, so Reza started on that and then um, Zara, so he worked on it for about a year and then Zara took over on that project under another uh, Canadian Frailty Network postdoctoral fellowship um, and we're now at the point where we have uh, a number of materials, a couple of materials that we're really excited about. We're in the process of patenting them and we're in discussions with um, Impacto who is a, um, a protective, they, they workplace safety, they produce workplace safety equipment um, and include sort of these overshoes uh, is one of their products that they sell. Um, where our goal is to get them to, to see if they can incorporate some of our slip resistant and wear resistant materials in their, um, in their overshoes so that we can turn any pair of shoes into a, a really good performing slip resistant pair. Um, and just as an aside, all of the testing we do on footwear are, can be found at ratemytreads.com. You can see the ones that um, that angle score is listed there. Um, and what we found is over, we've tested now over 100 pairs of boots and about, I think, seven or eight of them have met what we consider our minimum, um, our minimum standard for, for slip resistance. It gets one star, one snowflake out of three snowflakes, and it has to achieve at least a seven degree angle on on ice, uh, which is the same as what you would find on a on a curb ramp if you're walking up and down, off you know crossing the street going up and down a curb ramp. Our dream is that eventually, just like you have snow tires, you have this symbol on a snow tire that says that this you know tire has been designed and tested to be used on snow and ice. You know to to have some sort of label or symbol like that put on footwear to to show consumers, make it really easy for consumers to uh, to select the best approach the best footwear for them. Um, so I'll just end there by saying, you know, we're trying to support successful aging at home by filling in some of these gaps that exist by giving people better tools and training uh, so that they can uh, care, you know, the older, frail older adults and their caregivers can live safely at home. Uh, and the three projects that we talked about here, the toileting one, we're looking for a partner, posture coach and slip resistant footwear. We're kind of uh, in early stages of commercial, commercializing with, uh, with some partners that we've been working with for a while. So I'll end there. Thank you very much for, uh, for your attention and I'll, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Well, thank you, Talak. That's a great presentation, as you promised, and I uh, love your winter lab. I think it's very cool, and, and I want to visit it. <laughs> so you really highlighted the, the uh, challenges that people face in real life and, and you know, really worked hard to reduce those risks. So it's really nice to see some of these projects moving forward or potentially moving forward into practice. Um, so Thanks. Uh, we'll start. Some, some questions. Um, I had one question is about the posture coach and how much it weighed. And then sure. part two, did you, did you say you needed a cell phone to get feedback like it's an app? That's right. So, so the actual device itself is um, is very lightweight. It does come with some, you know, I'll, I'll try to bring it up here, um, some straps and things that make it a little more cumbersome. You know, this is, I'll bring up the picture of the first version of it um, here. Yeah, you can sort of get a sense of it in this picture. So the, the real sensors are actually quite small. They're very lightweight. Um, the, it's really more the straps and things. Oh, sorry, I guess I have to show screen again here. Here we go. 
hopefully people can see that now. So yeah, so the actual sensors here are quite small, um, lightweight, not a, not too intrusive. The straps, um, it's it remains to be seen whether, you know, the bigger question to me is whether people will feel funny wearing this thing if, if you're a personal support worker and you're going to provide care to a client. Will people be okay wearing this thing uh, in, the, in public or, or in a client's home? Um, and then your follow-up question was around whether you need the phone. So the first version of the system, the work that was really funded by the Canadian Frailty Network, um, TVN at the time, I think it was, the, it did require a phone. It was designed around an app. And so there was, we developed an app that would talk to these two sensors and you would have to put the phone in your pocket um, and feel the vibration or listen for the beeps. Um, that in itself, is a bit of a challenge because depending on how thick your clothing is, you know, I think most people agreed that the beeping would be uh, a little, you know, off-putting. You wouldn't want to have something beeping loudly when you're working with a client or a patient or something. So most people would use this thing with the vibration, we thought. Um, but to be able to actually feel that vibration, you know, it really depends on what kind of clothing you're wearing and whether it's tight fitting enough that you can you can feel the phone vibrating. So yeah, there's, there's some issues that we need to deal with. Um, and that's part of why we moved away from the phone. So the first version used a phone. The second version or the current version that we're working on right now um, is is a standalone system that has no phone associated with it at all. It would just be, um, it would be all, the hardware would be all kind of in one, one device. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I, I like the second version. Yeah, um, thanks. So I know you said that this was designed for healthcare workers and caregivers, but what could you see this being used in other industries? Yeah, I mean, really, the problems that um, the, the problem of back injury is a huge challenge across many, many industries. And, and for that matter, falls and back injuries are number one and number two in most industries uh, out there. And so, you know, I think we're we've designed this specifically for um, for healthcare workers in mind and, and thinking about how they would interact with such a system um, but I think there are a lot of other areas and we've already had interest from people in construction and um, in other uh, you know manufacturing industries uh, want to test it out e even to be used with athletes when they're um, doing you know very uh, specific types of exercises you want to avoid flexing your spine this idea of using your bending from the hips rather than flexing your spine it's something that um, that a lot of uh, athletes have to think about as well when they're doing their exercises so going back from that to the toilet toilet relocator um, yeah. how do you adjust the height in the picture there, I could see that, you know, you added an extra, you know, base, but that yeah. was for the elimination. What I, I didn't see the, you know, the base where you could pop it up or. Bring so, it so it's not adjustable. It's, it's, you okay. install it. The idea is with this, just like with Toilet Vader, the idea is that you you install this permanently. It's a hard piece of plastic that the toilet sits on that raises the toilet four inches. In our case, we're talking about raising it a little bit more than that, maybe five inches. And that, that is the fixed, that becomes the fixed height of the toilet. So whenever you're using it, you use it at that height. So the the challenge, of course, is that not every it may not be appropriate for everyone for shorter people this product is not going to be helpful because it's going to make the toilet too high for them um, but for uh, other people they would they would benefit from having that four or five inch um, adjust you know toilet height just be higher all the time making it easier for them to get on and off and now we have this added um, ability to have the toilet moved out from the corner of the room if that's a uh, that's a benefit 
Yeah, I, I do see the advantage of being able to move the toilet a bit. But if you have a husband and wife or two family yeah. members in only one bathroom and one's short and one's tall, that's, yeah. I would see that as being, you know. Absolutely. That's for only certain situations. Yeah, it, it's absolutely a limitation um, of, of the, yeah, of the design. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Very interesting. So why do you think our healthcare system doesn't put more in, in energy into preventing injuries? It's a, it's a good question. Um, I, I think, I, you know, honestly, I don't know. I, I know that, you know, even with the Ministry of Labor, so a lot of our work that we do is with the, um, is funded by the Ministry of Labor, um, you know, people that uh, be, because of you know the injury risk to personal support workers and nurses and things, um, and one of the things that one of the current studies we're working on right now, we're hoping to to show that you know show the business case like if you can prevent injuries, the savings to the healthcare system to the organization uh, are are huge. Like that's the and so we need to be putting you know if you have someone who's a larger person um, or you know, needs more help lift, getting lifted out of bed, things like that, that, that there should be two people being sent to a person's home as opposed to one. If you can save back injuries doing those types of things or giving people the right equipment is even better, Having making sure there's uh, patient lifting devices installed in homes, um, you know, the right types of equipment that, that reduce the loads on people, the costs of those, you know, people immediately look at the costs of the equipment without thinking about the costs of the injury and when you see the cost of the injury being orders of magnitude greater than the cost of the device um, it becomes maybe it's just not a clear enough uh, maybe it's not a clear enough uh, comparison that happens or it may be that the people that worry about the costs of injury aren't the same people that worry about the costs of putting equipment or training people in a certain way. You know, it may be that those beans come from different pots right now. <laughs> and, and I do get that because sometimes it is very disjointed. But do you know of anybody who's done, say, a health economic analysis or, you know, to prove that there's both economic savings and maybe mm -hmm. improving the quality of life? Because certainly your quality of life goes down a whole pile when your mobility is, you know, from a, yep. a preventable, you know. Yeah. So so certainly in in the for instance in the hospital environment in the clinical environment i know that there's been quite a few recent um kind of analyses of the costs of doing uh you know putting the right equipment and training in place for workers and showing that 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 um that when you do that you see a reduction in the injury costs associated with those workers um i think home care is still new enough and kind of so different, you know, every instance of home care, every house is different, every patient is, every client is different. Um, there may be someone who's done that. Uh, I haven't seen it done that convincingly. Um, but even even in the, the clinical case, you know, there's there's good evidence now that shows that getting the right equipment, you know, having lifts, patient lifts, and having good uh, coordinated uh, training programs for people where there's buy-in at all the different levels um, even though that's out there there's still not you know it, it still takes a lot to shift the system it's a uh, I think the health our healthcare system maybe is is slow and big and it's it's hard to turn it um, that could be one of the the challenges that that we have to deal with uh, yeah Certainly. I mean, there are statistics that are available. People are collecting data, you know, so it seems that there would be able to be some kind of economic analysis to, you know, maybe yeah. spend some more money in this area. Yeah. Um, I have another question. It's a, it's a fairly long question, but, um, and I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, but um, he uh, says, you made note of the challenges of taking research into practice, obviously still to be determined. However, we have struggled with educating caregivers, both agency-based workers and people at home of the existing pro products available. 
is there a database of the best products available, peer reviewed for a multiple, for a multitude of mobility needs that could be accessed and shared with the stakeholders? Similar to your, um, you know, your shoe thing is ratemytrends.com. Is there something like that for other devices that you know about mobility? Not, yeah, not that not that I've seen. Um, that and and it's it's a great idea I, and and one that we've been i've thought about um here and our team has talked about you know having a um there, there's a website called cool tools where it's it's more like products um you know recommended products for general use it can be staplers or it can be uh bidet toilet seats you can you can find out about that um but there isn't uh, as far as i know there isn't really a good place where people um list recommended or or evidence-based you know proven uh devices like that uh but it's it's a great point that it would be a very uh beneficial resource for a lot of people if if we were to start something like that yeah, something to consider so um all this being late getting late i have one final question and it was something that i asked you earlier but i'd like to share with the audience is if there's a way of uh, visiting your lab or learning more about the work your team is doing mm -hmm. yeah so my email address is at the bottom of the last slide here um, and yes we do tours of our facility all the time and i'd be happy to um, to arrange one if if you're interested if you're in the Toronto area we're we're at uh, we're right across from sick kids so it's University Avenue and Dundas is the closest intersection um, if you're in that neighborhood uh, feel free to send me an email um, you know we, we I need some lead time to set up a time to or, or find someone to do the tour. I do some of those tours. I'm actually on parental leave right now, and so I'm a little less available. Um, but we can we can definitely. There are a lot of volunteers that that take people on tours all the time. We'd be happy to show you Winter Lab as well as so that the Winter Lab is actually one of four labs that can be bolted onto that hydraulic motion base that you saw in that picture. Um, and so we, we the tour inc includes all of that stuff and, and all the different projects that, uh, that all the teams here are working on. Yeah, so please send me an email and I'll make sure that the right person gets, gets in touch with you to, to set that up. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Talak, for answering your questions and being available to, uh, you know, give a tour or have someone give a tour. I really want to visit your lab, hopefully in the near future, maybe after you come back from parental leave. Sure. Um, <laughs> so thanks to, uh, to everyone today who joined us, and I look forward to uh, our next webinar on September 13, and hope you'll register. And so... That ends our webinar today and hope everyone has a good rest of the day. And again, thanks so much, Talak, and you have a good day as well. Thanks, thanks everyone. See you. Me.